Right now on Morning News Now, new charges. This morning, Donald Trump is facing three charges in the Mar-a-Lago documents case, one of which alleges that the former president was part of a scheme to delete security video. Now, a third defendant has also been charged. The new charges coming just hours after Trump's legal team met with the special counsel's office ahead of a possible indictment in the investigation into possible interference in the 2020 election results. We have full coverage of both stories this morning. Also ahead, summer scorcher this morning. Nearly half of the country is waking up under a heat alert. And this is not just normal summer weather as July shapes up to be the hottest month ever. More on the alarming new data and when we might finally see some relief. Plus, it's called ICE Air flights, where all the passengers are being deported. This as the White House touts a major drop in illegal border crossings. But Republicans say the numbers are more than meets the eye. And eye in the sky. It's been one year since we first got a look at the interstellar images from the James Webb Telescope. And to celebrate, NASA is giving us a cosmic close-up like we've never seen before. The new insight it's giving us into the life of a star and the major discovery some 370 light years away. We'll never forget when we got those pictures. I know, it was so cool. Now think of how many more we've had since then. I know, and we're going to get into all the cool stuff that we've learned just from that telescope. Good morning, good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. It is a busy news day. We're going to get started this morning with major new developments in the federal investigations into former President Donald Trump. Special Counsel Jack Smith is leading both of these inquiries. Yesterday, lawyers from his office investigating alleged interference with the 2020 election met with Trump's lawyers. Trump has denied any wrongdoing, but Smith is believed to be preparing charges against him in that case. So far, that grand jury has not handed up an indictment. Now, in the Mar-a-Lago investigation, Smith announced a superseding indictment against Trump, which means Trump faces additional charges in that case. That includes one count of willful retention of defense information and two counts of obstruction. That brings the total number of charges in that case to 40, prosecutors are accusing Trump of ordering his employees to delete security video at his Florida home. One of those workers is also being charged. Maintenance supervisor Carlos de Oliveira is now accused of helping Trump hide the documents. The former president has already pleaded not guilty to the initial indictments against him and has denied any wrongdoing in these new charges. We did absolutely nothing wrong. This is just another hoax. It's called, uh, I would say, election interference more than anything else. It's a disgrace that they can do it. Next question. But everything was fine. We did nothing wrong, and everybody knows it. We've got a team standing by to cover all aspects of this story, from reaction on Capitol Hill to the campaign trail. We're going to start with NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent Ken Delaney. And so, Ken, the focus had very much been on Trump's other investigation into the 2020 election interference and the allegations there. But now we have this updated indictment on the Mar-a-Lago documents case. Walk us through what prosecutors are accusing Trump of in these new charges. Good morning, Joe and Savannah. Look, this is a deeply significant new development in this Mar-a-Lago case because it adds a new dimension to both the retention of classified documents portion and even more importantly, the obstruction of justice portion. So what it alleges is a new conspiracy between Donald Trump and his two employees to delete surveillance footage, which is incredibly significant and something I think every American can understand. And it also says that that document relating to a potential military options for Iran that former President Trump discussed on tape that we've all heard, uh, where he was sharing it with some people working on a book, that the government actually has that document, that it was turned over in the first batch on January in January of 2022 when Donald Trump turned over a set of classified documents. It's a top-secret document. So they've added that count to the indictment. But more importantly, they've added a new chapter. And as you said, a third employee, Carlos de Oliveira, the property manager at Mar-a-Lago. And what this indictment now says is that de Oliveira told another employee that Donald Trump wanted surveillance footage deleted at Mar-a-Lago a few days after a grand jury subpoena came into Trump's lawyers demanding that footage, and that Walt Nauta, the other co-defendant in this case, went down to Florida to try to make that happen. So really, really important new charges. So, I mean, Ken, we've got a new defendant, maintenance worker Carlos de Oliveira has been named in the case. What does the indictment say about his alleged role, and do we know how he's responding yet? 
His lawyer has declined to comment. He's expected in court in Florida on Monday to answer for these charges. Look, he's the property manager at Mar-a-Lago. And what this indictment says is that uh, a few days after Donald Trump got a subpoena for surveillance footage, which would have showed employees moving boxes of classified documents, his val valet and butler and now co-defendant, Walt Nauta, went down to Florida and had a conversation with Mr. De Oliveira, as recounted by other employees, to make it clear that Donald Trump wanted surveillance video footage deleted. Now, there's no allegation that the footage actually was deleted, and they don't have a direct witness who spoke to Mr. Trump, because De Oliveira spoke to Mr. Trump, Nada spoke to Mr. Trump. Both of those men are co-defendants. Obviously, the government would like to flip either of these gentlemen to have them testify against Donald Trump, but that has not happened yet, Joe. And, Ken, switching to the other investigation we've been keeping an eye on into accusations that Trump tried to overturn the 2020 election, what do we know about that meeting between Trump's legal team and the special counsel's office? Well, sources familiar with that meeting tell NBC News that it was a standard, typical last appeal by defense attorneys, knowing that their client is about to be indicted, making their case. Nobody thought it changed any minds. Uh, and we expect now an indictment in this, in this uh, January 6th related election suppression case any day now, given that Mr. Trump has received a target letter saying that he was liable for charges in that case. And so we don't believe that the grand jury is expected to meet today, Friday, uh, but generally that grand jury meets on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we'll be looking for next week for action in that case. All right, Ken Delaney, and keeping an eye on all of it for us. Ken, thank you. And now let's bring in NBC News correspondent Vaughn Hilliard for more on how the former president is responding. Hey, Vaughn, good morning. So we heard a little bit from Trump just a few minutes ago, but what else did he have to say? And what are we hearing from his legal team? Right. The difficult part here for Donald Trump is the fact that his legal defense counsel is trying to come up with their best way forward, knowing that a trial is slated to begin as of right now in May of next year. It is likely to be pushed back because of the superseding indictment. But Donald Trump's explanations of the documents that he retained at his Mar-a-Lago property, they have been uh, constantly changing and evolving explanations and defenses. I want to let you hear his latest last night with Fox. Take a listen. Everything was fine. We did nothing wrong, and everybody knows it. You're not concerned, then, with your own voice on those, on those recordings? My voice was fine. What did I say wrong on those recordings? I didn't even see the recording. All I know is I did nothing wrong. We had a lot of papers, a lot of papers stacked up. In fact, you could hear the rustle of the paper, and nobody said I did anything wrong. And the part about this is, is particularly there is around the Iran-related document that Donald Trump uh, had been recorded discussing. And this was a audio recording that was taking part as part of a book interview that he was doing related to his chief of staff. And in that audio recording, you can hear papers being rustled around. Donald Trump had suggested that they were newspaper clippings here at one point. But now with this new superseding indictment lays out that, in fact, it was a sensitive document. And the sensitive document was acquired by the Department of Justice as part of their efforts to get these documents here from Mar-a-Lago. And for Donald Trump, this is uh, undercuts the very defense that he had publicly made, that it was nothing more than articles and newspapers. But in fact, it was, in this particular situation, a sensitive document related to Iran and that he actually had held it up and showed other individuals who did not have the classification uh, uh, abilities to be able to access such documents. Ron, let's talk about what's ahead. As you mentioned, there is this set date of May 20th right now. First, I'm wondering, just walk us through why that is likely to be pushed back. But also what's interesting here, of course, is this is not just a former president that we're talking about. It is another presidential candidate. So talk about how this will impact the campaign and what we might see happen with that date as we move forward. Right, Savannah, we literally had the conversation just a couple of days ago, you and I, about May, that that was going to be after the Republican primary. We were likely going to know if he was going to be the Republican nominee for president in 2024 or not. But now this calls into question whether this trial related to the classified documents will happen before the general election of 2024, and that Donald Trump may be a defendant all the way through next year's presidential election because the amount of new evidence that the Department of Justice is required to turn over to the legal defense. And as part of this process uh, ahead of a, a criminal proceeding, 
Uh, it is the obligation of the Department of Justice to provide uh, all of the material that they have in their possession in which they intend to take to that trial and give it to Donald Trump's legal defense so that they can look and better understand what they're def uh, defending their client on. And because of these new not uh, only charges, but also the evidence that is uh, expected to come forward as a result, we should expect the judge to move this case back beyond May of 2024, potentially after the 2024 election next November even. And Vaughn, while this is all unfolding, Trump is not at all letting up on his campaign schedule. He has an event in Iowa alongside rival Ron DeSantis and other GOP candidates. We've also seen these fundraising emails come out as we've been discussing this. We've heard him talk about this in stump speeches. Quickly, we can expect more of that in the weeks and months ahead, right? Right. Donald Trump has used his legal perils to his financial benefit. I think it's important to understand we have watched, I mean, every day and uh, the Trump campaign sent out multiple emails uh, suggesting that they are trying to lock him up for life. The Department of Justice is trying to lock him up for life. And in the first six months of 2023, uh, they were able to effectively raise $53 million. And it's important to note that in those emails that they send out to supporters, 90 percent of that money, it goes to his 2024 presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. But 10 percent of those funds, they actually go to what is called the Save America PAC. That PAC has actually been paying legal bills for not only Donald Trump, but also other allies of his uh, in the past over the last year and a half. So that is where these fundraising is not only important for the campaign, but also for his own legal efforts here ahead. Vaughn Hilliard, as always, thank you very much. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos is here now to help us dig into these charges a little more. Danny, good morning. Let's stick with the Mar-a-Lago documents case. These new charges, what do they tell us about the investigation and the evidence prosecutors have collected? One of the first things I do when I get a superseding indictment, because it's difficult to compare them and find out what is new, and that's what everybody was sort of struggling with in the hours after the indictment came out yesterday is figuring out what is different and what is new. And one of the most obvious things is that there's a new defendant. The other thing that federal indictments do that make it very helpful is they list all the statutory charges on the first page. And the one new charge that uh, jumped out at me, and now that everybody knows about, is one that relates to destroying, uh, mutilating, whatever records in, that uh, may be used in an investigation. And that's exactly what's alleged here, is that uh, in the indictment you see that allegedly uh, the defendants were working to pressure even other employees at the Trump Organization or at Mar-a-Lago to destroy video, video that would probably, at least according to the indictment, be incriminating to them. So this is the only real question I still have is why now? Why was this not brought uh, in the original indictment? It, why did they only just now develop this information? But it's not uncommon for federal investigators to develop this on a rolling basis and obtain superseding indictments as they get more information about new defendants or new charges. Well, let's switch gears to this other investigation, interference in the 2020 election. Yesterday, we saw this meeting with Trump's legal team and special counsel Jack Smith's team. What did you make of that meeting? What does that mean might happen? And do we know when we could see something? It doesn't mean much. The government's always interested to sit down and meet with the defense. Uh, they'd be much more interested to sit down and meet with Trump, but Trump's defense team and no sane defense attorney would ever let their client go in and sit down and talk to the government when the client is a target. That is a huge no-no. Of course, the government would always welcome that and tell them, oh, yeah, tell us your story. We may reconsider. They're not going to reconsider. He's a target. People stay a target. Targets eventually get indicted in almost every circumstance. So uh, that meeting may have been another last-ditch effort by the defense to say, listen, here's our bullet points why our client should not be charged. It's a bad idea. Here's some extra information. The government will willingly take all that, use it if they can, and then probably charge him anyway. So probably the needle was not moved uh, by the defense yesterday as much as they mightily tried. All right, Danny Savalos, appreciate your analysis as always. Thank you so much. Yes, great to see you, Danny. Well, from Capitol Hill to the campaign trail, lawmakers were quick to react to this news about all this. Let's bring in NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Serkin with more. Hey, Julie, good morning. So first, just how are lawmakers on Capitol Hill reacting to this news? Yeah, good morning, guys. Well, it won't be a surprise to you or our viewers to note that very few lawmakers wanted to talk about this because, of course, we chase them for reaction after every single indictment and every single development in the former president's case. And the very few we heard from, there's a theme emerging, and I want you to pay attention to what it is. We heard first from some lawmakers who took to Twitter, right, because the Senate and the House 
We're almost out of town when these charges came to light. Marsha Blackburn, for example, writing on Twitter, quote, the DOJ's decision to pursue additional charges against President Trump is further evidence of the politi politicization of our nation's top prosecutorial agency. Then we heard from Roger Wicker, Republican from Mississippi, who said, as I have said repeatedly, justice should not be political or selective, and the powers of the government should not be weaponized by one party against the other. So this all comes, of course, as Republicans in the House are focusing on Hunter Biden and other investigations trying to connect and prove that they believe that the government under uh, President Biden is weaponized against conservatives. But Speaker Pelosi, the former speaker, actually spoke yesterday and had this to say. Watch. But the very idea that we're talking about such things very idea that his supporters think he is above the law. We just can't, as again, we don't agonize and organize because we want to unify. Now, before these new charges came to light, I was talking to Republicans earlier in the day about the other case, the January 6th, an election uh, interference case, and they were all saying just that. They were coming to the former president's defense. In fact, Senator Lummis uh, told me every single time this happens, he just goes up in the polls. What about on the campaign trail, Julie? Any of the other Republican candidates talking about the latest indictment, taking swipes here? Yeah, why don't you take a listen to the very few we heard from Senator Tim Scott, who's also running for president. Watch what he had to say. At the end of the day, what we all should be very concerned about is the weaponization of the Department of Justice. We should be very careful on how we use immense power against political opponents. So this talk of weaponization of justice, you'll hear that all these folks are not necessarily defending the former president's conduct. They're just saying that the government, in their eyes, is weaponized against conservatives and that they're trying to just prove a political point here. All right. Julie Serkin, thank you very much. We appreciate your reporting this morning. We're going to have much more on this story throughout the morning, but there is some other news to bring you coming up. Migrants are being turned away at the southern border and deported by plane. We're going to take you on what is being called ice air that's just ahead but first this month may not only be the hottest july on record it could just be the hottest month ever on record we're digging into the alarming new numbers on this historic heat wave and its potential long-term impacts that is up next much of the country is bracing for a sweltering weekend, the latest chapter in a summer filled with relentless heat that has been impacting millions in the U.S. and around the world. July is shaping up to be the hottest month on Earth since humans have been keeping record of temperature. Federal data shows that more than 2,400 high temperature records have been broken in just the last 30 days. This deadly heat is also shattering records throughout Europe. For more on this, we're joined now by Dr. Jennifer Francis. She is a senior scientist at the Woodwell Climate Research Center. Dr. Francis, good to have you with us on this important topic this morning. Obviously, the heat is on our minds, and we still have a long way to go this summer. We're likely going to see more records broken, along with the risk of wildfires, which goes well now into the fall. We've got a group of scientists there blaming climate change and the use of fossil fuels, saying it would be virtually impossible for this extreme weather without it. Help us understand, for those who are at all skeptical out there, what makes them sure that that is the case here? Yes, so it has been an incredible summer so far. We've seen, as you say, just uh, unbelievable heat in various parts of our country, but also in many places across the Northern Hemisphere, China, Europe. And in addition to some severe heat, we've also seen incredible flooding happening in uh, right here in New York, uh, upper state New York, Vermont, just a couple weeks ago, and even Western Massachusetts, and also across um, parts of Europe. And all of these are very clearly connected to the fact that the Earth is warming so rapidly. It's warming, we know, because we have been uh, putting greenhouse gases, heat trapping gases into the atmosphere uh, for the last several decades at an unprecedented rate. And those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere act like a blanket on the earth. They keep the earth from basically uh, releasing heat to, the, to outer space. Instead of it going to outer space, it's trapped down by the surface. And interestingly, people will say, well, the climate has always changed. Well, that is true, but there are natural factors that, that can change the climate. And if only those natural factors were in operation right now, the Earth would actually be in a cooling cycle. 
but instead we know it's warming at an, a very rapid pace, faster than we've ever seen going back into the records as far as we can look. And as you say, uh, this month, and we know that several days this month mm -hmm. have been the hottest days we've ever recorded. And those records actually go back almost 100,000 years. So let that sink in. Yeah. The hottest days in over 100,000 years of planet Earth. That is incredible. Dr. Francis, I want to ask you about another study we've been talking about this week that says the warming of the Atlantic Ocean could eventually lead to the collapse of a system of ocean currents and impact the Gulf Stream. Explain to us real quickly what that means and why that is so important. Yes, um, this has been uh, a topic of research for oh about a decade and a half now. Uh, we've seen uh, mounting evidence that this large ocean circulation system that includes not just the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is one branch of this that brings warm water from the Gulf of Mexico up to the northern North Atlantic, but it's part of a whole cycle that brings colder water also um, down into the deeper depths and circles all the way down to the southern hemisphere. So this uh, has the potential. We know this is starting to slow down. There's a lot of evidence suggesting that it's slowing down and it's connected to the increased meltwater from Greenland. And that, of course, is the result of the warming Earth. If this were to actually collapse, we would see Europe um, get much colder because the Gulf Stream brings a lot of warm water up to Europe. And it would have huge impacts on the marine ecosystem all up and down the Atlantic coast. Um, it would probably mean a lot warmer water along the eastern seaboard, which we, court, we know, of course, is connected to um, strengthening hurricanes. But I think the biggest impacts that are really hard to predict at this point are on the marine life and fisheries, and we've, we're already seeing coral dying down along the coast of Florida because of the incredibly warm temperatures of the water there in some places over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, Dr. Jennifer Francis, thanks for helping us better understand what's happening with our planet as we go into another just very hot weekend. Thanks for your time. Thank you. So important to keep talking about how this is connected to climate change. Angie Lastman joins us now on set for a check at your weekend forecast. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. Let's keep that conversation going when it comes to the heat, the climate change impacts. Let's start with those heat alerts because uh, we've added some of those on here in the past hour or so. 149 million people impacted by these heat advisories or heat warnings at this time. It includes major cities like Kansas City, Chicago, New York, Washington, uh, D.C., and of course out to the southwest where Phoenix remains under that uh, excessive heat warning through the day today. And for good reason, temperatures across the Midwest, into the Northeast and parts of the Southeast remain well above normal for this time of year. We're talking high 90s in most places for the actual temperature. We've also got triple digit actual temperatures in places like Omaha, St. Louis today. And then you add on that humidity, that moisture in the atmosphere, and you're going to see feels like temperatures well above 100. 109 for St. Louis, 107 for Raleigh later today. And New York expected to feel like 101 this afternoon. So another day, be mindful of your neighbors check on the elderly and those people in the more vulnerable populations. But also, if you have strenuous activity to do outdoors, maybe lawn care or uh, any construction work, those kind of things, make sure you're taking those frequent breaks and getting a little extra water. We do see some relief in the Midwest for tomorrow. We'll get back to those normal temperatures. We're talking low 80s for Minneapolis, Detroit. But New York, down through Charlotte and out towards St. Louis, remains with those temperatures well into the 90s, feeling like the triple digits. But some relief is on the way for folks there, too. We'll get back to those Average temperatures by the time Sunday, Monday rolls around across most of that area, the south or southeast rather, not the case. We stay above normal through the weekend and into early next week. July 2023, now we know from the World Meteorological Organization that it's on track to be the hottest month ever recorded across, across the globe. The first three weeks of July have been the Earth's warmest three-week period on record. So we're likely, with no end in sight, going to see this continue. Uh, and you heard Dr. Francis just talking about how 
warm it has been in the waters across the globe, too. We've got the North Atlantic at a record warmth of 76.8 degrees. Manatee Bay in Florida, as she mentioned, was over 100 degrees. That happened earlier in the week. The Gulf of Mexico at a record warmth, Mediterranean Sea, and the tropical Atlantic all running way above normal and breaking some of those records across the globe, guys. It doesn't, unfortunately, look like we're going to have a whole lot of relief when it comes to that. Uh, but at least parts of the Midwest will get back to those more normal temperatures in the coming days. Yeah, a tiny bit of relief there. All right, Angie, thank you so much. Well, now to the latest on the situation at the southern border. The Homeland Security Secretary was grilled on Capitol Hill this week over the Biden administration's immigration policies. This comes as illegal border crossings have declined significantly over the last two months. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez reports from Texas. None of the passengers on this plane want to be here. It's called ICE Air, and those on board are being deported. Right now, more than 100 migrants are being loaded from these buses onto this plane. They're bound for Honduras. Since mid-May, the Department of Homeland Security says it's repatriated 85,000 people. That's up 65 percent compared to the same period last year. The department is uh, sending a clear message about the consequences of coming in the United States seeking asylum improperly. NBC News also getting rare access to this processing center in Hidalgo, Texas. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. But this week, Mr. Homeland Mr. Security Mr. Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas was grilled on Capitol Hill. You're the most dishonest witness that has ever appeared before the Judiciary Committee. You should be impeached. The administration touting a 42 percent drop in illegal crossings since the pandemic border restriction known as Title 42 was lifted in May. Our approach of expanding lawful pathways for people to uh, reach the border and delivering consequences for those who arrive at our border irregularly is working. Mallorca says the process is more orderly, but the drop in the illegal border crossings does not mean there's been a big decline in migrants coming into the U.S. Multiple law enforcement sources tell NBC News the numbers are still high, with Republicans now blasting the Biden administration for creating a new legal channel, releasing tens of thousands of migrants each month into the U.S. who use a new mobile app to schedule their screening appointments. You've got the turnstile open, where so long as they've gone and downloaded this app, you just let them in. In Matamoros, Mexico, we found a tent camp with more than a thousand migrants, many telling us they're still waiting for months to make an appointment on the app, often getting error messages. This man from Venezuela, with severe pains in his leg, rushed to an ambulance after collapsing in the sweltering heat. Many women and children in this camp need help, he begged. That was Gabe Gutierrez reporting. Well, this week, a federal judge blocked the Biden administration's new policy that could drastically change the immigration system again if that ruling goes into effect next month. More international headlines now. A major typhoon has made landfall in China. Claudia Lavanga joins us now from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudio, good morning. Good morning. That's right. Southern China has been battered by heavy rains and violent gusts of winds as Typhoon Doksuri has made landfall this morning, whipping power lines, uprooting trees and forcing businesses to shut down. So far, no immediate reports of injuries or fatalities have been made. With a wind speed of 85 miles per hour, it is the second strongest typhoon to land in the Fujian province since 2016. Just before approaching the country, it battered Taiwan and the northern Philippines, causing a a ferry to capsize near Manila, killing at least 25 people. Now we move to West Africa, where soldiers in Niger have overthrown the country's elected president, Mohamed Bozoum, who is now being held captive by military officers. The UN suspending the humanitarian operations in the country and demanding the immediate release of the president. The French foreign minister says the French president, Macron, has spoken to President Bazoum and says he is in good health. And we end up with a record-breaking duel a Norwegian woman and a Nepali man became the world's fastest to climb all 14 tallest peaks. The pair last latest feat was K2 in Pakistan, which is the world's second highest at over 28,000 feet. Before topping K2, they climbed Everest, Annapurna in uh, Nepal, the Broad Peak and others for a total of 14 peaks in 92 days, beating the previous record of all peaks in six months and one week. Now the duo's latest feat has yet to be recorded in the Guinness 
the book of world records, guys. Wow, they right. really beat it. No kidding, they should write their own book. Half of the time, yeah, <laughs> thanks, that's awesome. Thanks, Claudia, yeah. appreciate it. Coming up, we're staying on top of all the major new developments in the two federal investigations into former President Trump. Up next, we're going to dig into those new charges in the Mar-a-Lago documents case and where special counsel Jack Smith's investigations could go from here. We're back with the latest on the two federal investigations into former President Trump. This morning, he is facing new charges in the classified documents case out of Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, and additionally, another person has now been linked to the case, and that man is now also facing charges. Civil rights attorney and former prosecutor David Henderson joins us now with more on the investigation. Hi, David. Good morning. So are new charges like this on top of ones that have already been filed? Is that unusual in a case like this? Savannah, it's not unusual for prosecutors to amend an indictment and add new charges. What's unique about these new charges are the way they affect how you're going to present this information to a jury. When you do something wrong and you run from the crime scene or you try to cover your tracks, juries always find that persuasive. And effectively, that's what this indictment says. You know what? He was concealing information from the government. He knew it was wrong until so he tried to delete the, the security camera footage that showed he was doing it. That's really what changes this indictment in terms of the way things typically proceed. So this new defendant is a worker for Trump, essentially. Trump's valet, Walt Nada, already facing charges as well. How significant is it that the DOJ is charging people, like a maintenance supervisor and a valet, in a case where the other defendant is the former president of the United mm -hmm. States? Very significant here for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, it adds more pressure to people, and it's another leak that you have to keep plugged. Every mob movie we've ever watched talks about people not talking for exactly this reason. The more people you add into the case, the more likely it is that someone's going to get nervous under the pressure, and they're going to flip on you. That's especially true when you're mm. a former president, and they can't afford lawyers without your help. And they also realize that if, if people get convicted, the likelihood of a former president actually serving time are extremely low, but the likelihood of you serving time are relatively high. David Henderson, thank you very much. We appreciate your time this morning. Well, much of the rhetoric around the indictment and how to proceed circles around the fact that this is unprecedented. So as we watch this history unfold before our eyes, we want to consult an expert on the subject. Michael Beschloss is NBC News' presidential historian, joined us now to help put this into some context. Michael, always good to have you with mm -hmm. us. I mean, this is obviously a significant moment in history with chapters written day by day, week by week, mm -hmm. month by month. As a, a historian, help us understand just the gravity of the situation right now. Well, these are about the most important things a, a president has ever been accused of doing, or an ex-president in this case. Uh, we're, we're watching indictments unfold that suggest that President Trump kept some of our most important national secrets, took them to Florida, may have shown them to other people. Uh, that's something that anyone else in American society would pay a very heavy penalty for. And then, of course, if we get to January 6th and those indictments un un unfold, those would be related to a president of the United States waging a coup d'etat on the 6th of January and an insurrection against Congress and his own government to try to keep power, even though he lost an election. That's what Jefferson Davis was accused of at the time of the Civil War and four years of military conflict followed. Michael, there's been so much talk since we've never seen a former president in this position about what ultimately happens here. What does this ultimately mean? Even David Henderson, who was on just before you mentioned the likelihood of him serving prison time could be very low. And then there's been all this talk about executive privilege and immunity. Does a former president have a degree of immunity in a circumstance like this? He doesn't have any more immunity than you or I do or than Joe does. I wish we did, but we don't. And that's because when, in, under our society, when a president leaves office, he or someday she is a citizen just like a, anyone else. So for Donald Trump to claim, as he has from time to time, that he has some kind of special privilege or special immunity or, you know, other favors that should be accorded to the next president, very nice, but it's not in the Constitution. Mm. But if he's convicted, then reelected, as far as we know, can he pardon himself? Uh, the, the legal experts are mixed on that. Some mm. say yes, some say no. 
But we are so far in, in territory that we've never seen before in American history, Joe and Savannah. You know, it's anyone's guess. You know, Trump seems to want this played out on camera in front of the public, something that's not typically done in federal court where we don't even yeah. have the cameras in the courtroom. Does this give him any sort of advantage when it comes to public opinion or could it hurt him in the long run? Could hurt him in the long run. His assumption is that if his supporters see him on trial, they will be so outraged that they might support him all the more. And that has turned out to be true, at least in polls. Indictment after indictment, his numbers generally do tend to go up. On the other hand, Americans are not accustomed to seeing an ex-president day after day in a courtroom. I think that might be a different experience. Plus, I would tend to agree with him. I think this should be on television. This is a trial of mm. such national momentous, momentousness in American history. I think everyone should watch, and everyone should watch very carefully how the judge behaves. Michael, while this is the first time that a president has been indicted, we have had some close calls in the past, at least three of them. Tell us about those and any, anything we can take from those, any learnings from that that might tell us and indicate what could play out. Well, Savannah, the closest call that America had was in 1974. Richard Nixon resigned on August 9th. For the next month, the special prosecutors in the Watergate scandal were talking very seriously about indicting him for obstruction of justice, a phrase we've heard in the last 24 hours, and other things that very probably would have sent him to prison. His successor, Gerald Ford, pardoned Nixon, saying the American people could not stand the idea of a president going to jail. That's as close as we've come, mm. but that's not the same thing as indictments in various venues, state and federal, that we are about to see trials, presumably of in the next year, and a president in much greater legal jeopardy, which with much greater accusations. Mm. All right, Michael Beschloss, as always, appreciate talking with you in moments sure like do. this. Thanks for taking the time Same today. Here. Thank you both. <laughs> well, coming up, America's oldest craft brewery has been in jeopardy, but this morning there is a new effort to save it. We'll take you inside the grassroots push to rescue a San Francisco institution. But first, a dramatic hearing to decide whether a Michigan school shooter will spend life in prison. The never-before-seen video and disturbing revelations from inside the courtroom. Next. We are back now with an emotional day in a Michigan courtroom. A hearing was held for the gunman who carried out a mass shooting at Oxford High School back in 2021. NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa has the details. In a Michigan courtroom, agony on display. Victims' families crying as prosecutors played never-before-seen surveillance video of the 2021 Oxford High School shooting that killed four and wounded seven. Video the judge directed media not to show. A teacher no. describing uh, hiding in lockdown had, after uh, being shot. Sent my husband a text message um, that just said, I love you, active shooter. Ethan Crumbly often looking down emotionless as Oakland County prosecutors argued the now 17 year old should serve life in prison without parole, the harshest possible penalty under Michigan law for a rampage that haunts first responders tasked with running past the wounded to stop a killer something we weren't prepared for is how do you push past a child that needs help. Crumbly pleaded guilty last year to 24 counts, including first-degree murder and terrorism charges. Prosecutors leaning on his social media posts showing off his gun, video of him at a shooting range, journal entries about torturing baby birds, and a video of Crumbly describing his desire to kill. I understand my consequences. I understand that people put me in prison for this. Crumbly was 15 at the time of the shooting. These proceedings are known as a Miller hearing. They're required since a Supreme Court case struck down mandatory life sentences without parole for minors. Defense attorneys argue he can be rehabilitated, that he came from a violent home and wrote about wanting help, controlling his anger. The fact that a vile offense occurred is not by itself enough to warrant the imposition of life without parole. A judge declining to let Crumbly's parents attend the hearing, each facing charges of involuntary manslaughter. For investigators say giving their son a gun for Christmas, despite signs he may be violent. Jennifer and James Crumbly have pleaded not guilty, both via their attorneys declining to comment.
Prosecutors say these proceedings could last into early next week, and among those still expected to testify, several students who witnessed the massacre. Back to you. Maggie, thank you very much. The Department of Justice has announced that it is investigating the city of Memphis and its police department. The investigation stems from allegations of excessive force, improper searches and arrests, as well as the use of discriminatory policing. The death of 27-year-old Tyree Nichols at the hands of Memphis police earlier this year made national headlines, though the DOJ says this new investigation is not linked to any one particular case. There's no timeline on just how long the investigation will take, but the DOJ says that it does plan to share its findings. Now let's get you some financial headlines. We have a major recall from Ford this morning. CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us now with that and other money news. Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning, guys. Yep, Ford is recalling more than 870,000 F-150 pickup trucks due to the risk that the electric parking brake could activate while the vehicle is in motion. The recall affects trucks made from 2021 to 2023, those model years. It's only for the gas-powered F-150s, though, not the electric F-150 Lightning. American Airlines Pilot Union has reached a deal on a revised labor contract that matches the gains seen in, for the pilots in rival United. Last week, Americans said the new proposal would raise the value of the contract to more than $9 billion. Southwest is now the only major U.S. carrier without a new contract. This, as some analysts estimate, that the U.S. is short about 10,000 pilots. And Chick-fil-A is developing two new restaurant concepts, one an elevated drive through the other a digital walk-up service. Now, they're designed to improve the whole ordering process and experience. Chick-fil-A says digital orders now make up more than half of total sales in some markets. The elevated drive through will be built in Atlanta, and it'll have, get this, four lanes that pass under the kitchen and can handle 75 cars. Meantime, the digital walk-up concept will be tested in New York and will only serve as a pickup for mobile orders. Four uh, you know, lanes? I am fine with that. <laughs> four lanes know, is like that a that highway, way? yeah. <laughs> wow. It's right yeah. under a Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A well, I, I guess Chick-fil-A is really popular in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Go. All right, I've yeah. seen the walk-ups with uh, Starbucks here in oh, town. Oh, yeah, I've right? been noticing those, those are, too. Those yeah. are great ideas. Yeah, it's cool. Well, so. All right. Bertha, really good to see those you. Thank you so much. Terrific idea. Thanks, Bertha. There is an effort underway to save the historic Anchor Brewing Company in San Francisco. The company's Japanese owner plans to shut down operations next week unless the brewery's employees can come up with the money to keep it open. NBC News' Jake Ward has this story. It's a scramble to save a 127-year-old craft brewery, one of the oldest in the country. Hey, make no mistake about it. Anchor Steam is a small operation. Anchor Brewing survived San Francisco's devastating 1906 earthquake and both world wars. But the pandemic and the economic turmoil that came with it seems to have been the beloved brand's breaking point. Anchor Brewery says we're tapping out. In the days since the announcement, long lines of people showed up to fill up for what could be one of the last times. It's loyal customers not ready to let go just yet. It's very sad. I'm a native San Franciscan, and I've been drinking the beer as long as I can remember. If there's a standard bearer for beer, this was the place. Now, one group is pulling together to try to save the brewery. It's workers. They say they want to buy the place for themselves and run it as a co-op. A lot of us are born and raised in San Francisco. We care about what this company was and what it can be. It's an effort led by the workers' union, which says they sent a letter to Anchor's parent company, the Japanese megabrewery Sapporo, which bought Anchor in 2017 for a reported $85 million. Now, Anchor Brewing says they're open to it if the money is there. A spokesperson telling NBC Bay Area, quote, should our employees put forward a bona fide, legally binding offer, one that includes a verifiable source of funds, we would gladly consider it. But they say time is running out. The business will unwind at the beginning of August, just days away. Workers like Kieran Engemann say they're committed. It's the beer of San Francisco. It's the beer of everyone who's grown up here. So it's about time that it's made by workers, owned by workers, and ran by workers. The effort is happening during massive turmoil in the labor market, with labor unions flexing their muscles. Multiple high-profile disputes across the country. Actors and writers striking against Hollywood, out fighting for a new contract. The Teamsters just announcing a deal with UPS to avoid a massive walkout. Plus, tough negotiations are ongoing for thousands of FedEx pilots and auto workers. But at Anchor Brewing, employees are hopeful they'll be able to save the company by buying it. Our ask to Sapporo is give us enough time for us to have a fair shot. 
Our thanks to Jake Ward for that report. Well, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors has backed the workers, putting out a resolution saying they should be allowed to take over the business and given the time they need to raise those funds. Coming up, it has been one year since we got our first look at images from the powerful James Webb Telescope. And this morning, the galactic glasses are giving us new insight into the life of a star. We'll have that in a major discovery hundreds of light years away up next. We're back with a bunch of bologna. This enormous bologna sandwich has been unveiled and devoured at a community fair in Lebanon, Pennsylvania. It is 150 feet long, which makes it one of the biggest ever made and the equivalent of 900 normal size sandwiches. If you want to try making it at home, you're going to need 600 slices of provolone cheese, 1,200 slices of bologna, and we don't even know how much bread. I call this an afternoon snack. The sandwich was <laughs> sponsored at $100 a foot with all donations going toward the Lebanon County Christian Ministries efforts to help those with food insecurity. So it's all for wow. a good cause. It's a lot of baloney. Looks pretty good. As you said. <laughs> Very often, rarely do you hear that at a news station. Yeah. All right. We love our space news here at Morning News now. So we want to take the opportunity to look back at a year of stunning images and discoveries from NASA's James Webb Telescope. That's right. Look, they're all around us, these gorgeous pictures. Well, this month marks one year since President Biden held a briefing with NASA to unveil the Webb Telescope's first photos. Here to break down some of the discoveries that this telescope has made as astrophysicist and NASA advisor. Dr. Paul Sutter. Always great to see you. Thanks for joining us. So first, let's talk about some of these big discoveries that the Webb Telescope has made possible. What stands out to you? Oh, wow. It's hard to pick a favorite over this past year because James Webb is a machine for making incredible science. Uh, but some of my favorites are the observations of distant exoplanets. These are planets that orbit other stars outside of the solar system. And the James Webb is particularly tuned to study the atmospheres of those planets and particularly looking for signs of life in those atmospheres, we may, it's a long shot with the James Webb, but we may just find our first evidence for life outside of the Earth using the James Webb Space Telescope. I wonder if the telescope picked up the bologna sandwich the other day. That <laughs> it's been probably large thing. enough yeah. to be seen from space. So the big discoveries continue earlier just this week. It was revealed that the telescope was able to spot water in young planetary system. Explain to us what this means, why that's so yeah. important. Yes, uh, the James Webb is studying the formation of stars and planets, among many other science goals. And recently, uh, the James Webb a team of astronomers used the James Webb to find uh, that a newly forming system with a very young star with young planets, including a young rocky planet, just like the Earth is just now forming, has an extreme abundance of water along with it. Uh, we're not exactly sure sure how Earth got its oceans, whether we were born with the water or the water came later through cometary and asteroid impacts. And this lends credence to the idea that the Earth was maybe born with water. And where there is liquid water, there is the chance for life. Wow. NASA also says this is cool that there's enough fuel here for this to operate for at least 20 years. This wasn't just one and done. We are going to keep getting pictures, keep getting discoveries, right? What can we expect next? Yeah, this is fantastic because the original planned mission was only five years long, but the orbital insertion went off just right. And so there's plenty of fuel, like you said, to last uh, for two decades. And what I'm particularly interested in with the upcoming result is James Webb isn't just looking at young solar systems. It's looking at the young universe. It is studying some of the first stars and galaxies to ever appear in our entire cosmos. That's when our universe was less than a billion years old. That's like a tiny fraction of its present age. And so we're looking into so deep into the past that hopefully we'll get some results soon about how those first stars and galaxies appeared on the cosmic scene. Dr. Satter, always great to talk to you. What a cool conversation we get to have. Happy one year of these gorgeous <laughs> images. Thank you. Good to see you. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Don't go anywhere. Good morning. Happy
happy Friday. We are happy to be with you this morning. I'm Savannah Sellers. I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, new charges. Former President Trump now facing a superseding indictment filed by special counsel Jack Smith. These new charges focus on his handling of classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago estate. What we know this morning about them, the political fallout, and the Mar-a-Lago worker who has also been charged. That's all happening after Trump's legal team met with Jack Smith's team yesterday over his alleged efforts to overturn the 2020 election. We have got all the latest developments on both cases. Also this morning, melting the history books. Nearly 150 million Americans, almost half the country, under heat alerts. And this comes as a new record is expected to be broken. July on track to become the Earth's hottest month on record. That's got the White House taking action. More on the Biden administration's new plans to try and help Americans beat the heat. Plus, LeBron James is breaking his silence following his son's terrifying collapse from a cardiac arrest. His message to fans as Bronny returns home with some good news from his doctor. And it's Friday, so we've got your can't miss list. That includes the critically acclaimed return of those New York heroes in a half shell. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles <laughs> are back on the big screen. Now you're going to have that song from the I know, cartoon right? in your head. <laughs> Little pizza on this Friday. You've got your April O'Neil yellow <laughs> on right now. I'm just realizing. <laughs> huge fan. <laughs> Clearly. Yes, I know something about it. I was when I was a kid. All right, more on that coming That's up a cute. little later. We are going to begin this hour with those major legal investigations into former President Donald Trump. Yeah, special counsel Jack Smith has filed additional charges against Trump. These were included in an updated indictment announced yesterday yesterday involving the investigation into Trump's handling of classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago home. Those new charges come after Trump's legal team met with a special counsel yesterday to discuss the probe into possible 2020 election interference, raising the prospect of another indictment for the former president. Our coverage begins with NBC News correspondent Garrett Haig, who is at the district court in Washington. All eyes in Washington yesterday were focused on this federal courthouse behind me, where grand jurors had been hearing evidence in the 2020 election interference case. But that's when special counsel Jack Smith dropped this bombshell new indictment in the other federal case against the former president involving his handling of classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. The new indictment alleging the former president conspired with two employees to try to have potentially damaging evidence against him destroyed. Today, former President Trump is facing three more criminal charges related to his handling of highly classified documents at Mar-a-Lago, made public in a new indictment filed by the special counsel Thursday. It charges Mr. Trump with one additional count of willful retention of national defense information and two additional counts of obstruction. It also adds a new third defendant, Mar-a-Lago property manager Carlos de Oliveira. Mar-a-Lago surveillance video key to the new charges. Prosecutors say when Mr. Trump heard of the government's request for classified material from Mar-a-Lago, he said, quote, I don't want anybody looking through my boxes. And isn't it better if there are no documents? The government says the boxes were later moved. After the FBI search of the property, the government demanded surveillance video. The next day, prosecutors say the former president called his property manager and spoke for 24 minutes. Two days later, according to the indictment, De Oliveira and Nauta, quote, went to look at surveillance video in a security booth and walked through a tunnel with flashlights pointing out surveillance cameras. A few days after that, De Oliveira met with a security employee in an audio closet, telling him that, quote, the boss wanted the server deleted. According to the indictment, the employee responded that he, quote, would not know how to do that and that he did not believe he would have the rights to do that. The indictment, which outlines various meetings between De Oliveira and Nauta in the bushes around Mar-a-Lago, does not say whether they were able to delete any video. A lawyer for De Oliveira had no comment. They want to take away my freedom. Mr. Trump, in an interview with Fox News Digital overnight, called the charges, quote, ridiculous and said he was facing harassment. He has already pleaded not guilty to 37 federal felony charges in the classified documents case brought by the special counsel in June. We have one set of laws in this country and they apply to everyone. We also learned yesterday that the former president's attorneys met with prosecutors from the special counsel's office about that 2020 election interference case, a meeting that the former president would later describe as productive. Whether he'll be indicted in that case and on what charges remains unknown. All right, Garrett, thank you so much.
Let's get some legal analysis now with NBC News contributor and former prosecutor Kristen gibbons Fedden and NBC News legal analyst and former federal prosecutor Carol Lamb. Good morning to both of you. Uh, Kristen, let's start with you. How serious are these new charges and how do they change the complexion of this case? I think they're very serious. Um, and with the new details being more specific, it's really damning evidence. You know, he's facing these significant new charges. Carlos de Oliveira is a new defendant. It's definitely going to change the trajectory. There's not going to, in my opinion, going to be the trial date as currently set because there may be new motions. The Oliveira may want to sever. There's going to be a lot of different things, but I think one of the things that is most damning is that in addition, um, you know, Trump's public denials, um, the indictment directly contradicts it. So I think this is going to be really damning. Um, it's not going to be good. And it shows that there are escalating legal risks, notwithstanding the new the other charges that could come out of Georgia, as well as the 2020 election interference. Carol, one of the key accusations here is that Trump allegedly ordered his employees to delete security video footage at Mar-a-Lago. Even if it's not actually shown in the indictment, could it mean that prosecutors have strong evidence related to that specific allegation? Oh, yes. In fact, I think what we have an indication here of is uh, the first real cooperating witness that Jack Smith has. Look, there were four people, according to the indictment, involved in the discussion about destroying the surveillance tapes. Three of them are now charged in the superseding indictment. That means the fourth employee, referred to as employee number four in the indictment, is likely cooperating because the indictment talks about conversations between that employee and the new defendant in the lawsuit. Those are not conversations that anybody else was privy to. So I think this changes not only the kind of charge in the indictment, but also the nature of the evidence that Jack Smith now has. I think this is devastating to the former president. Kristen, how typical is this to see additional charges added to an indictment? Is it possible we could see this happen again? I think absolutely. As Carol pointed out, there could be additional cooperators here, and those people could still be charged, maybe even with a lesser charge, uh, depending on the level of cooperation. But it's not atypical. It's not abnormal. Whenever a prosecutor indicts, the investigation is always ongoing. New evidence could be obtained and new uh, defendants could be charged. So this is not atypical uh, in these types of cases. And Carol, you know, I mean, this sort of caught us off guard yesterday, the superseding indictment. We've been waiting for word on that other federal investigation. As we mentioned, Trump's lawyers met with the special counsel's office yesterday to discuss the 2020 election interference probe. That kind of meeting between Trump's attorneys and Smith's office, is that typical? Could the fact that the meeting happened tell us anything? The fact that the meeting happened is very typical. I think most people have been speculating that it was a last-ditch effort by the defense team to talk Jack Smith out of bringing the indictment. That's very unlikely to succeed. It is also possible that they met with Jack Smith's team in order to talk about the logistics of what will happen when the indictment comes down, because, as we've seen, there are always security concerns. Will there be a self-surrender? I think there will be a self-surrender, but um, I, I think that even Jack Smith's team knows there's very little likelihood that they are going to talk Jack Smith. Um, I'm sorry, even the defense team knows that there's very little chance they're going to talk Jack Smith out of bringing this indictment. Hey, Carol, if we know with this other case, with the uh, documents case, that trial is happening in Florida. If we do see an indictment in the election interference case, do we assume that all happens in Washington or is that unclear right now? I think it's pretty clear that that will happen in Washington. I think Jack Smith would have brought the Mar-a-Lago case in Washington if he felt that he had the what we call venue, the ability to bring it in Washington. But the facts were so located in Florida that he had to bring the case there. I do think the challenge for Jack Smith now is one of time. And I think that Kristen is correct that now there's pressure on the Mar-a-Lago case to be put off um, additionally, if the judge manages that trial very well, she might be able to keep the May 20th, 2024 trial date, even with the addition of new charges and a new defendant. But Jack Smith's team is coming up against the 2024 election, two cases that have to be tried 
hopefully you know their wish would be to try both of those cases before may and before the uh, 2024 elections that's going to be really tough all right Kristen and carol thank you both appreciate your analysis well, this morning, the plea deal for Hunter Biden remains hanging in the balance. The president's son had been expected to plead guilty this week to tax evasion charges and put his legal troubles in the rear view. But this plan was put on hold when a federal judge raised concerns over the agreement. Joining us now with the latest on this is NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles. Hi, Ryan. Good morning. Great to see you. So remind us how this plea deal fell apart here. What were some of the judge's concerns when it came to the agreement? And was it a surprise that this is the way that it went? It was a, a real surprise, Savannah. It was stunning to be in the courthouse and see it all play out the way that it did. We expected it to just be a very normal uh, and run-of-the-mill court proceeding. But instead, the judge really identified two specific problems. One, the parameters around the plea arrangement that would allow Hunter Biden to plead not guilty to two misdemeanor tax charges and avoid jail time. Uh, it, it seemed clear to her that the two sides had not agreed what that would mean for Biden's political future in terms of the, the immunity that he would then receive from future possible prosecution. And then the second end of it was a diversion program that Biden is set to participate in to avoid another separate gun charge, which carries with it a 10-year prison sentence. The two sides wanted the judge to be responsible for monitoring Biden's participation in that diversion program. That's normally not the role of a judge. She felt that there were constitutional issues involved there. So she told the two sides she could not agree to their plea arrangement as it currently stands and gave them 30 days to try and fix it in a way that could satisfy her. Savannah. Right. Let's talk now also about the White House's response to this case. I know the White House press secretary was directly asked about the potential of the president pardoning his own son. Tell us what we've heard. You know, Savannah, almost every time the White House is asked about uh, Hunter Biden's case, they do everything they can to not engage, mm -hmm. saying that there's a, a line between the White House and the Department of Justice and that the president loves his son and leave it at that. But this time, Karine Jean-Pierre was asked a very specific question about the potential of a pardon for the president's son. And listen to how she responded. Is there any possibility that the president would end up pardoning his son? No. I just said no. I just That's answered. Go ahead. Go ahead. So she didn't engage any further on that point, but the fact that she was so declarative is important, Savannah. It shows that the White House has established a line that they will not cross when it comes to Hunter Biden. So, Ryan, there were a lot of questions when this plea deal was on the table about these other investigations and what it kind of meant there. Now, obviously, we just have more questions. What comes next in this? Is there going to be a new plea agreement? So that is the hope, uh, probably from both prosecutors and the defense team, that they'll be able to try and solve the issues related to this particular plea agreement and that Hunter Biden will ultimately be able to plead not guilty to those tax charges. But it doesn't eliminate the whole host of other legal mm -hmm. problems that Hunter Biden could be facing, particularly as it relates to his foreign business dealings. The prosecution in the case was asked directly by the judge in that hearing if the investigation into Hunter Biden was ongoing, to which the prosecutor responded yes. And then, of course, there are the political problems associated with this. Republicans on Capitol Hill continue to do their own investigation into Hunter Biden. And they're also trying to establish some sort of direct tie between Hunter Biden's business dealings and the president himself. They've yet to establish any hard evidence in that realm, but they're certainly going to continue and then ultimately use this as a political tool that could potentially hurt the president in terms of the 2024 reelection. Ryan Nobles, thank you very much. Appreciate your reporting. In the wake of Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell's latest public health scare, the issue of age limits for public officials is once again in the spotlight. NBC News national correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from the campaign trail in Des Moines, Iowa, with more on this. Gabe, good morning. Joe, good morning. It's one of the reasons that voters we've been speaking with here on the trail say that they are considering uh, GOP hopefuls like Governor Ron DeSantis and others, their age. In politics, it's a difficult and delicate subject. Is it vetting or ageism? This morning, Republicans standing by Mitch McConnell. Mitch is strong. He's stubborn as a mule. But concern remaining after the Senate minority leader froze for nearly 20 seconds Wednesday before being led away from the cameras.
Later, the 81-year-old brushing off health concerns and back on the Senate floor. Meanwhile, Democrat Senator Dianne Feinstein, who at 90 is the oldest member of Congress, appearing confused in a committee meeting Thursday, interrupted after she began to make a speech when she was only supposed to say I or nay on a bill. It funds priorities submitted. Yeah, just say I. Okay, just... Aye. Feinstein's office saying the morning was chaotic and that the senator was preoccupied. Feinstein has faced scrutiny since returning from a two-month medical leave for shingles. Both she and McConnell are among the nearly half of U.S. senators at or above 67, the retirement age for most Americans. With the 2024 campaign ramping up, age is an issue that could increasingly play a role in how Americans vote. President Biden is 80. The GOP frontrunner, former President Trump, is 77. A recent NBC News poll found compared to 2020, voters are increasingly concerned about either of them having the necessary physical and mental health to hold office. More than half for Mr. Trump and more than two-thirds for Mr. Biden, who recently joked about his senior status. I know I'm 198 years old. But after tripping and falling over a sandbag last month and falling several times climbing the stairs to board Air Force One, the president has started using a shorter staircase more frequently, a sign of just how important optics can be for voters. I'm 84, so I know what age means. So 84. Do you <laughs> yeah. think an 80, a president should be 84 years old? No, 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 no. It would be nice to have a choice that is not an octogenarian. Isn't there something to be said, though, for experience and wisdom? <laughs> yeah, course, but when you're not cognitive, it, you know, what good is that? Here in Iowa, Senator Chuck Grassley won re-election last year, meaning he'll be 95 at the end of his current term. Joe. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, thank you so much. Well, 146 million people across the country are under heat alerts at the moment, more than at any other point so far this summer. This comes as July comes to an end and could be the hottest month ever recorded. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa joins us now from New York City with more on the heat. Emily, good to have you with us. So yesterday, you know, President Biden announced plans around protecting people who have to be mm. outdoors during dangerous weather as part of their job. What does that include? Yeah, hey there. Good morning. Good to be with you. President Biden points out that heat is actually the number one weather-related killer. And so these latest measures are really targeting and seeking to help people working in those vulnerable working populations. So you think about people working in construction, people working in agriculture. He is directing the Department of Labor to ramp up uh, inspections for people in those fields, as well as the enforcement of heat safety violations as well. He also uh, issued a hazard alert to tell employers what to do, how to keep their employees safe. And then NOAA is investing millions of dollars into improving weather forecasts so that people can have the most accurate possible forecast ahead of extreme weather, extreme heat, like so much of the country is seeing today. Roughly 150 million people across the country from California to Maine are experiencing such extreme heat. Here in New York City, we are bracing for the mercury to rise on the thermometer to the mid-90s today. And we continue to see some staggering records set across the country. You look at El Paso, Texas, for instance, and they've seen triple digit temperatures for more than 40 days in a row. In Phoenix, Arizona, they've seen temperatures topping 110 degrees for four weeks straight. So it's just an unrelenting summer of brutal heat, guys. Oof, absolutely. Emily, there's also an economic impact to all this too, right? Yeah, aside from the obvious of, okay, the electric bill is going to be higher because people are running their air conditioner on full blast, there's also an impact to the gas bump. And here's why experts say that in such extreme heat, it can actually cause equipment failures at oil refineries that will impact production and in turn push up the price at the gas pump. Over the past month, we've seen uh, the national average of a gallon of gas increase by 18 cents, Savannah and Joe. You know, we know about the obvious weather-related dangers, sorry. but there might be some. Just my <laughs> Just pen throwing pens around like, here. Sorry. We're sweating. We can't hold on to anything. <laughs> what are some of the ones it people may not weird. have considered, some of those dangers? Yeah, well, I think one of the things, Joe, we talk a lot about the air temperature, but certain surfaces will also increase in temperature to a higher degree. And I'm going to walk over here to show you what I mean. So we've got this surface thermometer. It'll tell you just how hot the blacktop is. So we look right now. Remember, it's early in the morning. It's about 86 degrees. But on a day like today, guys, where we're seeing mid-90s, 
things like this could reach a staggering 140 degrees. So you really have oh to be mindful, goodness. especially of pets or really hot surfaces, because it's going to be scorching. Ooh, We're hearing about those burns people have suffered in Arizona in the southwest. Area yes, as well. exactly. So, and important right. to keep pets in mind, walking yep. them in this. Exactly. Wow. Emily Aketa, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks. Stay cool. Absolutely. And our heat coverage continues with Angie Lassman. Yeah, she is back with us with the morning news now weather forecast. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. We, of course, are going to continue to talk about that heat, but we've also got some strong storms that we'll have to be aware of across the country here through the day today. So we, this is what your satellite and radar looks like right now. You can see some of these thunderstorms working through parts of the Midwest, and that's one of the spots that we're really going to see the better chances uh, of some of these stronger storms to develop through the day today on top of some of these showers and thunderstorms we can see through the state of Florida. But the severe threat is really focused across parts of the Midwest. It does include places like Des Moines stretching into Chicago for that enhanced risk of the severe weather. But again, Sioux Falls, Omaha, Peoria, Indianapolis, all included in that uh, slight risk as well. That means the hazards will include those strong wind gusts. We're talking 60 miles per hour or higher. The hail up to two inches or larger. And we're not going to rule out a couple of these tornadoes. Now, the good news is behind that system that's working through, we're going to see a little bit of relief from the heat in the Midwest. Uh, but as we get into tomorrow, the severe threat will shift with that system moving a little farther to the east through parts of the mid-Atlantic. So New York, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., stretching into Roanoke, all going to have the potential to see some of those stronger storms developing on your Saturday afternoon. The hazards remain the same. Hail may be a little smaller, but again, can't rule out a couple of tornadoes as we get into your Saturday afternoon plan. So just make sure that you have those plan, that plan B if you are going to be uh, out and about into the afternoon hours outside uh, in that area. We'll also add on some additional rainfall. Some of these spots really need that additional rainfall, but we could be talking one, maybe two inches of rain in some of those areas that pick up the most. And we'll likely see a flash flood risk in that same area through the day today and potentially lasting into tomorrow uh, for folks in the mid-Atlantic. So bring your umbrella if you're going to be uh, making uh, your way outdoors for the rest of today in parts of the Midwest and in parts of the mid-Atlantic for tomorrow. Now the heat, of course, this has been the story for it feels like an eternity. 140 million people impacted with these heat alerts right now. Where you see the bright pink, that's the heat warning for places like Kansas City, Des Moines, St. Louis, stretching into Washington, D.C. And of course, our friends out in the Southwest that have been dealing with this for such an extended period, Phoenix included in that heat warning. The brighter orange, that's a heat advisory. Still, places like Little Rock and Nashville extending out into Raleigh are going to continue to see that be in effect here through at least the day today. Some spots could see that through Sunday. So just a heads up on that, especially out in parts of the Southwest. Where we're going to see some changes is going to be in the Midwest, but not today. We'll still reach into the mid-90s for Chicago and feel like 105 this afternoon. Warmest part of the day hits 99 in Nashville, but feels like 106. Uh, New York ends up at 95 and feels like 101. So a lot like what we dealt with yesterday in some of these same spots. But notice that cold front works through behind it. Uh, some more comfortable conditions, especially for places like Detroit, Minneapolis, back to normal temperatures, which should be low 80s, not those low to mid, even, even high 90s that we're seeing through the day today. Places like Cincinnati, St. Louis, and stretching out east, that's going to continue to be well above normal, high 90s, triple digit for your feels like temperatures, but then we'll finally get back to those more normal conditions by the time we get into Sunday, Monday for places like New York, Washington, D.C. hits the mid 80s as we round out our weekend and head into our next work week. The southeast, a little bit of a different story. We are going to continue to see the heat last through the weekend into the early parts of our next week, mid 90s for Atlanta by the time we get to Tuesday. That's an improvement from Sunday and Monday, which we'll see 97 degrees, Tallahassee, same kind of range, triple digits for our friends in Shreveport, Baton Rouge, Memphis, you'll end up at 95 by Tuesday. So really not a whole lot of improvement for our folks in parts of the southeast, guys. Uh, but the Midwest is going to see a little bit better conditions. But uh, really, I, I wish I had better news when it comes to some relief for folks here because they've been dealing with it for an extended period. Tough. Not to mention the southwest, too. Tough for part of the country, but I'm team cold front. Yeah, me too. <laughs> hey, cold yeah, front. Cold dish. Cold dish. Cold. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Angie. Appreciate it. Coming up on Morning News Now, we are hearing from LeBron James about his son's health scare, his message to fans as Bronny heads home from the hospital. But first, a summer health alert will take a closer look at the rise of potentially life-threatening allergy to red meat that is caused by ticks. That's up next.
We're back with a health alert as officials warn of an unusual allergy to red meat that's on the rise. According to new CDC research, the condition is triggered by tick bites, something that is a common occurrence this time of year as we spend more time outdoors. Yeah, well, since 2010, more than 110,000 cases have been detected, but the CDC estimates this figure might actually be greatly underestimated. Joining us now to discuss is Dr. Tara Narula. She's a cardiologist at Lenox Hill Hospital at Northwell Health. Good morning. Good Thank morning. you so much for being here. Okay, so I unfortunately have had the displeasure of having a tick bite before. Oh. And you learn that there's all these different kinds. Mine was an American dog tick. This, I think, is a Lone Star tick. Is it that is. right? Yes. Tell us how it's possible that a tick bite does this to you. You would never think that, right? And this is an interesting allergy that was really first published about in 2008. So we're learning more and more. But essentially what it is is an allergy to a carbohydrate or a sugar that many animals carry that we don't have as humans. So mm. the tick carries that sugar, alpha-gal, in its saliva. When it bites you, it injects that into you. And so for many people, they see that as something foreign because we don't have that, that sugar. And then one or two or three months later, when you sit down to eat your red meat meal, your body suddenly sees that sugar again and thinks it's a foreign invader. And so it releases the antibodies and the full-blown allergy attack. Um, and that's essentially how it happens. And yes, it is the Lone Star Tick, which is predominantly in the South, the Southeast and Mid-Atlantic, although we are seeing cases as far north as Maine, in New York, and even out West. You know, it's not just new to us, it's new to some doctors. There's some yeah. numbers here, the CDC finding 42% of doctors had never heard of it. 35% saying they were not confident in their ability to detect or treat the illness. Why are doctors having such a hard time diagnosing it? And because of that, then what symptoms should we be yeah, aware of so we advocate. can maybe go to our doctors? Yeah, and that's so important. And I think one of the big issues is that typically with an allergic reaction, the reaction happens pretty closely timed to when you eat the food. So you can easily say, oh, I ate shellfish and now my throat's itching. With this allergy, mm -hmm. the reaction doesn't happen until hours later, sometimes anywhere from oh, two to 10 or 11 hours later. So it would be very hard for someone to potentially think back and say, maybe this happened because I ate red meat. Especially if you've eaten it your whole life. Exactly. Like, and so, you know, for many people, they've never heard of it. They're not aware. The doctors haven't heard of it. And so, as you mentioned, it can fly under the radar. And in fact, there was a study in 2015 that found that for 80% of people, it took seven years to get diagnosed. And the interesting thing is there is a blood test that you can get, an easy test to essentially pick up those antibodies and tell someone if they have it. And once you diagnose it, you can avoid red meat. And hopefully over a couple years, maybe four or five years, the allergy wanes over time. So would you, like, if somebody knows that they had a tick bite, because sometimes you don't right. unless you find that rash or you find the actual tick would you just recommend if you know that to keep an eye out or, or how do you kind of even ask for that blood test yeah I mean I think if you have any of the symptoms which you asked what those were and those would be gastrointestinal symptoms okay. so anything like nausea vomiting diarrhea itching hives shortness of breath tongue swelling or even anaphylaxis um, that wow. may be timed to when you ate meat red mm -hmm. meat in particular not chicken or uh, fish, then you should think, you know, maybe this is related to that. But interestingly, some of these people actually have an allergic reaction to dairy and even gelatin coated medications that have that alpha gal sugar in it. Um, oh so goodness. very, very interesting um, and really important to watch for ticks and, you know, do all the measures we know are important to avoid ticks. Absolutely. And check for them in the summer. Check your pets for them. Check uh, your kids too. Yes. yes. Oh, great <laughs> advice. Dr. Tara Narula, thank you so much. Thank you. Great information. International headlines now, starting with new developments in the war in Ukraine. Claudio Lavanga joins us from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudio. Good morning. That's right. Well, the president of Russia, Vladimir Putin, said that hostilities have intensified significantly as the fighting increases or escalates rather in southeastern Ukraine. Now, a U.S. official said Ukraine has begun to commit troops from the 10th Corps, although it's not certain all of its units are moving into the fight. Ukrainian troops have been making gains in its counteroffensive since early June, even though Russia claims they have suffered heavy losses. Now we travel to Mexico, where officials report to extreme heat has killed at least 249 people over the past four months. The country has been enduring high temperatures alongside southern U.S. states due to a heat dome. 
Last month, some Mexican states hitting 113 degrees. According to government data, over 90% of deaths were due to a heat stroke and the rest due to dehydration. And we end up, well, in space. Astronomers have discovered water vapor near a star system. The find was made using the James Webb Space Telescope. They say they've seen water before, but not in a system where planets are currently assembling. The origin of the water is not clear, but scientists aim to use other Webb's instruments to study the system in the hopes of getting a greater understanding, guys. And it's the anniversary of, of this telescope, yes. so there you go. And we've been told 20 more years right. or so of <laughs> Images to come, so more to come. That's All right. forward to. <laughs> Claudia, thank you so much. Thanks, Claudia. Coming up, LeBron James is now speaking out about his son, Bronny's health, after he went into cardiac arrest during practice earlier this week. We've got his message to fans and some good news about Bronny's condition. It's coming up next on Morning News Now. We're back now with the latest on that disturbing story out of Ohio, where after a drawn out chase, a police officer released a canine dog on an unarmed black man who appeared to be surrendering. This week, that officer was fired. And this morning, we're hearing from the man who was attacked. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park joins us now with more on this. Kathy, good morning. Hey, guys, good morning. Well, the incident was captured on video. A police dog released on an unarmed black man who was pulled over initially for a missing mud flap on his truck. Now, Jadarius Rose, a man bitten by that canine, is speaking out for the first time. We want to warn you, the video of that altercation may be hard to watch. Come to me! 23-year-old Jadarius Rose is at the center of a now viral video that shows a police officer unleashing a canine dog on him, even though he appears to be surrendering. Rose now sharing his story for the first time with her Tom Yamas. I just didn't want to lose my life. This edited dash cam video released by the Ohio State Highway Patrol shows a prolonged police chase in Jackson County, Ohio, back on July 4th. The police incident report states troopers initially attempted a traffic stop because the semi-truck Rose was driving was missing a left rear mud flap. Is there a reason why you didn't stop? Scared. You were scared? A 911 call that his attorney indicated was Rose seems to confirm that he was afraid. I parked the truck and um, I was about to comply with them, but they all had their guns drawn out for whatever reason. Um, it seemed like they're trying to kill me. You need to comply with them. Roughly 30 minutes later, this edited body camera footage shows Rose exiting the truck with his hands up, appearing to surrender. An audio of a state trooper clearly and repeatedly warning a local officer. Do not release the dog with his hands up. But Officer Ryan Speakman did, seeming to command the dog to specifically attack Rose. Get the dog off of it! Get the dog! Wednesday, the Circleville Police Department fired Officer Speakman, saying in part he did not meet the standards and expectations we hold for our police officers. Speakman has not commented publicly about the incident or his firing, but the police union representing him has filed a grievance fighting to reverse a termination. Jadarius Rose's attorney, Ben Crump, saying the firing is a good start, but hinting there may be more legal action ahead. This is not 1960. This is 2023. And so far, no civil suit has been filed in the case, but Rose is facing a felony charge of failure to comply with the traffic stop. As far as a canine involved in the incident, the company in charge of its training says the dog's protocols were followed and that Circleville's canine team is being sent to their facility for evaluation and more training. So, so a lot of eyes on this case for sure. Definitely. All right, Kathy, thanks for the update. Appreciate Thank it. You. Good to see you. We also have an update to a story we've been following this week. Basketball superstar LeBron James is speaking out after his son Bronny went into cardiac arrest rest during a basketball practice at UCLA earlier this week. And with Bronny now out of the hospital, we are also hearing from the doctor who treated him. NBC News contributing correspondent Kaylee Hartung joins us now from Los Angeles with the latest details here. Hi, Kaylee. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe and Savannah. It was encouraging to hear that Bronny James was out of the ICU less than 24 hours after he was rushed in on Monday. And now more good news that he is recovering at home today. This scary incident, it's all put a new spotlight on the prevalence of these kinds of emergencies involving young people. The number of sudden cardiac arrest cases in kids playing sports, I think you will find is truly startling. 18-year-old Bronnie James, now discharged from the hospital and resting at home. 
following his sudden collapse from cardiac arrest during a basketball practice at USC Monday. His cardiologist sharing the good news in a statement, writing, thanks to the swift and effective response by the USC Athletics medical staff, Bronnie James was successfully treated for a sudden cardiac arrest. He arrived at Cedar sinai Medical Center fully conscious, neurologically intact, and stable. Going on to say, although his workup will be ongoing, we are hopeful for his continued progress and are encouraged by his response. Cardiologist Gregory Katz, who didn't treat James. The ongoing workup is a battery of tests looking at the heart muscle, the blood flow, the electrical activity, as well as everything else to try to figure out why did this happen. Bronnie's superstar dad thanking the public for their love and prayers, tweeting, everyone is doing great. We have our family together, safe and healthy, and we feel your love. His son Bronnie's emergency shining new light on cardiac arrest incidents in young athletes. These kids survived, and it happens in nearly every sport, in startling numbers. Every hour in this country, on average, a child under 18 collapses from sudden cardiac arrest. Studies show it's the leading cause of death for kids in sports, with African-American college basketball players like James at the highest risk, though researchers don't know why. Uh, we've had a, a heartbreaking situation here. In 2020, former University of Florida basketball forward Keontae Johnson collapsed from cardiac arrest just minutes after a game tipped off. He was later diagnosed with athlete's heart, an enlargement of the heart due to systemic training. Johnson is there for the dunk. Johnson had to sit out for two seasons, but returned and went pro, drafted by the Oklahoma City Thunder in June. I just want to say thank you for all the support y'all gave me. Now the question is, as Bronny James recovers from his cardiac emergency, how will it impact his future on the court? Kaylee, like you said at the beginning of this, the increasing number of young people who suffer from sudden cardiac arrest is, it's surprising, it's scary, it's upsetting. So if you have teenagers who play sports, is there anything you can do to try to protect them? Yeah, well, Savannah, experts say first, before your teen plays any sport, make sure they get a full medical screening and the appropriate mm. tests, and then, you can ask your school or your kid's sports league, do you have defibrillators on site at every yeah. practice and game? And are your staff trained in CPR and AEDs? That can truly be life-saving. And finally, if your teen's exhibiting symptoms like shortness of breath or dizziness, you've got to take these symptoms seriously. They can be early warning signs that they're at risk for cardiac arrest, and you should take them to a doctor to get checked out. Really Savannah. good advice to-do list for parents there. Kaylee Hartung, thank you so much. Coming up, beating the odds. After the break, we're going to introduce you to a man who's looking to bring awareness to the sometimes sky-high prices of having a disability. And get this, he's doing it by running a marathon on crutches. We will bring you this conversation up next. We're back with financial headlines. If you've got Verizon or AT&T, we've got some bad news. You might see a new fee on your bill starting next month. That's right. Bertha Coombs is here to explain that and tell us some other news. Hey, Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning. Yeah, they're calling it a fee, but it just seems like a price increase to me. AT&T and Verizon are notifying customers on older unlimited plans that they'll be seeing a new fee on their bills starting in August. Verizon customers on social media say the company has sent notices of a new monthly plan rate adjustment charge of $3 per line. Older plans such as 5G Start cost about $70 a buck, uh, $70 a month for a single line. Those are the ones that are affected, so then that'll be $73. AT&T's rate adjustment will cost customers on older plans such as Unlimited Elite an extra $250 per month. That legacy plan comes in at about $85 a month for one line. Meantime, a new player in the electric vehicle market world is breaking into the U.S. market. VinFast, that's a Vietnamese automaker, is starting construction today on an EV factory in North Carolina. The company telling CNBC the plant is designed to produce up to 150,000 vehicles a year and is expected to start operations in 2025. VinFast's main model, the VF9, is expected to begin uh, at around $85,000 for the Eco version versus $100,000 for Tesla. Model X. Because they'll be produced in the U.S., the VF9 could also qualify for federal tax credits. 
And DoorDash is working on an AI-powered chatbot to speed up ordering. Bloomberg reports it would allow customers to get personalized restaurant recommendations with simple text prompts. The system, which is being tested on a limited basis, will have a warning mission message, though, that the technology is experimental and accuracy could vary. DoorDash commands about two-thirds of food delivery sales in the U.S. I can just imagine if the accuracy gets it off in terms of, like, the number of burritos you're ordering, right. <laughs> yeah. you know, right. two versus 20, right. that it's could a, be a problem. It sends you a tennis shoe and a hot dog bun, and you're <laughs> like, this is not what I wanted. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what the concern would be, or, like, estimating the wait time or, or what that would be. Interesting. Find out. All right, yeah. Bertha, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, when he was just 15 years old, Alex Parra lost his leg to bone cancer. He wanted to keep on running, though, and playing sports, but he found out that getting the specialized prosthetic leg wasn't covered by his insurance, and that would cost him $35,000. So Alex decided to raise awareness about the big costs that disabled athletes face by trying to tackle a marathon without a prosthetic leg, mm. instead doing it all on crutches. He joins us now for more on this amazing challenge. Alex, good morning. I mean, any marathon, including San Francisco, is tough enough anytime, especially with a first attempt. Congrats, yeah. you made it more than Thank halfway <laughs> around. What inspired this idea and what kept you going when things got tough? Yeah, I was honestly just to raise awareness for these prosthetics because it honestly shouldn't cost that much. I shouldn't have to spend $35,000 in order for just to me to run or for me to try out a sport that... I would want to do when I was younger. So when I found out how much it was going to cost me when I lost my leg, me and my family were looking around like, we can't afford this. How are we going to do that? So mm. I really wanted to just bring a light onto this issue and hopefully bring some change to that as well. Absolutely. Just your smile is so infectious, just seeing you immediately when you come on and, and this what we're discussing. I mean, I'm sure this was a tougher time back when you first learned, if you could take us to that moment, that this was going to cost you $35,000, knowing that it's something that can greatly improve your ability to do things that you love. How did you feel and what did you learn about why and how it's possible that these sorts of things are not covered yeah i was just shocked i when i lost my leg it just i didn't think it was going to be that much i just thought i would have all the stuff and the necessities for my life when i lost my leg and just moving forward with sports and athletics and to learn that it wasn't covered and to learn i would have all these different challenges on top of cancer and losing my leg it's just mm. it honestly it was just shocking so i'm really hoping that there's change in the future for it so talking about change last year there were lawmakers in maine they passed a bill that requires insurance policies to cover mm. prosthetics used for recreational activities like running also swimming does that give you hope that things are changing it gets me super excited because when i was i, I just never thought there would be change i'm like my whole mm. life I was looking forward into the future, I thought it was always going to be costing an X amount of money. But the fact that there is change slowly being incorporated into bills and into all these different states, it's so exciting because like, oh, my gosh, there's actually I have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Alex, how, the, how are you doing, by the way, with your health now? A, a lot better now. I'm be officially cancer free on January 11th, 2024. Oh. So I've had cancer twice, I had stage two bone cancer, and then stage four lung cancer. So hoping for that single day where I could get my golden ticket for cancer. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I know that this has just totally blown up on social media, which is fantastic. And we're so happy to see it. What are you planning to do next to try to raise awareness for this cause? So the long term goal would be to do an Ironman on crutches without my leg, the bike without it, the, the swim wow. without it and then the run. So that's the long-term goal. And I'll actually train for that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, help us understand. I can understand the prosthetic helping with running. How would you swim without any sort of assistance? Yeah, you just go without it. When I first was learning how to swim, it was just zigzagging everywhere because my my, my balance was just completely off. So it's just going in without it and just doing my best. <laughs> oh, Alex, you are an inspiration. You really are. We wish you all the best. And please keep us updated on this effort because this is really an important topic. Yeah, it Thank is. You so Thank much. you very much. <laughs> Wonderful to meet you. Well, coming up, if it's Friday, you know it is time for our Can't Miss list. We've got the return of those heroes in a half shell. Turtle power. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are on the big screen. And our entertainment guru, he's a guru now, Chris Witherspoon, joins <laughs> us to break it all down. Stick around. <laughs>
Welcome back. Well, the Emmy Awards have been postponed as the Hollywood strikes continue. The 75th ceremony was set to take place on September 18th, but SAG-AFTRA prohibits actors from publicity. That includes campaigning for their nominations or attending ceremonies. WGA writers are not allowed to write monologues or jokes for hosts and presenters either. So a new date has yet to be chosen. This will actually be the first time the ceremony has been postponed since 2001. That was following the September 11th terror attacks. No surprise there. Mm -hmm. We're kind of expecting that would yeah. happen. So we'll see when it when it comes back. All there right. Well, the Hollywood strike is affecting the future projects that are still plenty. There are still plenty of shows and films coming out this weekend. That's right. And we're going to tell you all about them in our weekly can't miss list. Joining us to help us guide us through is Chris Witherspoon. He's the founder and CEO of Pop Viewers and an NBC News entertainment contributor. Chris, Good always on. fabulous to see you. Okay. So this first one, Haunted Mansion. Yes. I love the ride at Disneyland. Yes. Love the ride. Yeah, it's like the best ride. Obviously. It really, I mean, it's just, it's so fantastic. <laughs> so, but what about the movie? People this liking one, it? So this is based on a ride that came out in 69. Um, it stars Rosario Dawson, Lakeith Stanfield, uh, Winona Ryder, Jamie Lee Curtis. It's about a single mom who gets this deal of a lifetime, so she thinks, uh, on a haunted ma uh, mansion, but she realizes she has to bring these folks in to help her kind of exercise the house and like clean it of all the demons. Uh, people are loving it. Yeah, for good. sure. All right. Well, Looks really good. That. I so. like to see it. <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's, it, to me, it's kind of cool because well, it's based on history. Right now. It's haunted mansion. Something that came out. It's not, right? It's not. It's not. It's not scary. Justin Simeon, the director, he wanted to really make this a tribute to this ride that so many folks have known. Again, it came out back in 1969. It's beloved. And this cast, again, Rosario Darst and Jamie Lee Curtis, uh, some great folks. Tiffany Haddish also kind of making a comeback. Uh, but the other film folks just see this this weekend in theaters is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. It's been 33 years, you guys, since the first wow. uh, film came out. I was uh, in diapers when that first came out. A baby. <laughs> Joking. <laughs> but this has been really trying to reintroduce the franchise to a whole new generation of young people who haven't really heard about this uh, group of folks. But so it's Jackie Chan. He's voicing Splinter, which is oh, kind wow. of the headline okay. here for me. Uh, also That's Ice so cool. Cube. He plays the villain. And then Seth Rogen and Maya Rudolph are also voicing characters. But the, the whole, the young Turtles and a Half Shell. They're trying to save New York City once again from this villain who was once a mutant. That's Ice Cube's character. Wow. So it should be pretty good. So many great camp. We've been te teasing it all morning. Yeah. I, that's how I learned my artists as a young person was yes, the Donatello, names of all of them. Yes. And, and, and Savannah didn't realize she's giving us her April O'Neil yellow. Yeah. Oh this my God, morning. you are. Intentionally. Joe yes. just whipped that out. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, wow. I mean, I mean I April was a reporter. Fan. Remember? True fan. I so, know. Right. Right. April's back in this one as well. Yeah, yeah. Like it's all those characters. Okay, another thing that we can watch. The Last of Us, huge hit based on a video game series. Yes. Another one's coming to Peacock. Another video game yes. based series, it's right? Twisted game. Metal. Uh, Twisted Metal, I played this one growing up as well. And it's, it's, it's a game that came out back in 95, but it stars Anthony Mackie. He plays this outlaw driver who basically drives around. He's always shooting super duper fast. Um, but he's he plays a character called the Milkman, and he delivers these packages in this po post-apocalyptic world. Uh, you see Nev, uh, Nev Campbell's also in it, but it's an incredible He's also executive producing it. Um, I think that there's going to be a built-in fan base of folks that played the video game right. who are going to watch this just like okay. The Last of Us, for sure. And finally, we've got two streaming season two debuts, yes. so shows that have been on that will be debuting. we got Heels and This Fool. Yes, the first one is Heels. The song stars is season two, and it's not about stilettos, as, as I thought it was going to be about stilettos. It's not. <laughs> um, this is about a country. It's like a country western a wrestling series. So these oh. two brothers who were down in Georgia, all the thick accents, great bodies, if you will, um, <laughs> but they're they're kind of warring over their father's wrestling dynasty. So it's kind of like that show Pea Valley, and it's like the slice of life of this country town, but there's all the drama, and it's very, very soapy. Just so you know, a heel is a bad guy in wrestling. Oh, come on! Yes. A face is a good sense. guy, a heel is a bad guy. I can't so that's really random that's things what that it is. Joe okay. is really into. Not shoes. Love when we get I love this. I love <laughs> stilettos. Okay, and then the other one is it's called, there we go, it's <laughs> The other one is called This Fool, with me this morning, um, and it's kind of slipped through the cracks, you guys. 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's a comedy about this guy named Julio. He's in South Central Los Angeles, and basically his whole life unraveled in the first season. He lost his job, he lost his girlfriend, 
and this season he's trying to redeem himself and get his life back together. But again, critics are really loving this one. Audience score of 90% oh. and 100% oh. on the Rotten Tomatoes meter, which is kind of crazy. Very good. Yes. Oh my gosh. You gotta check those out then check while we're out. inside I feel like in the air conditioning. People have gotten like kinder in their reviews or something. There needs to never be high reviews like that. <laughs> Barbie was very opera. It's awesome. I think you're right. I think yeah. folks just want to watch something. Yeah, no kidding. Unplug from all the heat. <laughs> there we go. Chris Witherspoon, great to see you. Thank, Thank you so much. You. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.